Hey, this is Will Hawkins from Hotel Americana, and I'm thrilled to have Johnny Resnick of the Goo Goo Dolls here on our debut episode. He's gifted us with amazing songs like Name, Slide, and he has his latest album, Chaos and Bloom, that is out now. And they're getting ready for a massive tour with OAR. So please welcome to the show, Johnny Resnick. Johnny, thank you so much for having for coming along. Uh, great to be here. Great to be here, Will. So I know you've got this latest release, Chaos and Bloom, and it's the first album that you've produced. So how did how did you come to decide to do this on your own? And how did you prepare for it? Um, more or less, I produced it. <laughs> I, I produced as much of it as I could, and there were other people helping me. And when I like, and when I found myself in the weeds, I would call someone to come in and help me. You know, yeah, uh, pull it, pull it out of the ditch. Um, you know, Greg Wattenberg, who's a great songwriter, great producer, he helped a lot. Um, you know, so so. Uh, how did I prepare for it? I went up to Buffalo and I, and I was kind of like, I'm just going to just go free, whatever. I'm not like, I'm, I'm at, a, I'm like, I'm at a point in my career where it's kind of like, well, do I have to, do I have to have like a, a radio hit or whatever? Right. I don't know. I just wanted to make a record that I was just, I was just experimenting, you know, with, if I wanted to play with a synthesizer one day i would play with a synthesizer one day if i wanted to just uh sit and and abuse a compressor or a or a or a delay you know i would do that you know or or if i just wanted to play guitar you know into a microphone and and yell you know i would do whatever i wanted to do and then things started to sort of take shape out of that and, and then what I wanted to do after I collected a bunch of ideas, I wanted to get into a studio with the drummer and the bass player, Robbie. And I wanted either those two to play together and capture that or the three of us to play together and capture that live. Because I was listening to a lot of our live uh, recordings and I'm like, wow, there's this interesting push pull that goes on between the bass and the drums. Obviously, that's always the way it is. And, and the way the guitar sort of fits into that or keyboard or whatever. And, um, and, and like, I remember, you know, like you listen to like these old recordings and they're like, okay, uh, she loves you, uh, you know, take 27. And so we were doing that kind of thing. Right. Like we're gonna play this song all day. And then, Sometimes I'd be out in the room playing live with those guys. And then, but I wanted them to have eye contact with each other. You know, I really, yeah. wanted, because those two guys have a language between each other, you know, and then, uh, and then, and then, you know, and then we would work with it and then, okay, let's add some of this. Let's add a little of that. We'll do a couple of overdubs. Um, and it was just like, you know, some of the songs were like five minutes long and it's kind of like, well, we'll worry about that later. Right. Because I, I hate that. Like when it's like you're writing a song and then somebody says, you know, you're, you're over three minutes. And it's yeah. kind of like, yeah, right. so what? I'm over three minutes. Who cares? Yeah, yeah. you're going to do an edit. As if hey, it's a whatever. three and a half hour Godfather movie, right? right? It's just like, no, dude, it's five minutes. Uh, five minute song, who cares? <laughs> Did um, you... Did you have those songs written before you went in the studio or were those evolving while I you had, were recording them? They well, they evolved as we as we recorded them. You know, like I was I was listening to them and I'm like, wait a minute, we need to make a left turn here. Yeah. Or or you know what I want to try? I just want to try and call call this guy Billy in. Uh because we recorded up in up uh in Hurley, which is right next to Woodstock. Yeah. Um at um at uh, Jerry Murata, the drummer. Yep. From Peter Gabriel, he's got a studio up there. And uh, and uh, it it was a lot of fun. And and uh, you know, so so things would just go back and forth, and we lived there. And I wanted to have that experience. It's like, well, we went out in the woods, kind of went to camp. We went off the right. band and came out with a record. You know. How long was that process by from the time you went in on your own and then by the time you, everyone had recorded their tracks? About eight months. <laughs> it took a long time. I'm like, 
Was there yeah, a lock on the door? Did you let these guys go home? What's that? Did you let these guys go home or did you lock oh, them in their room until oh, they're done? Oh, no, because I want you know, because I didn't want to do it like like a lot of times because of like budgetary constraints and yeah, other things like that. It's like you write the songs, you write the songs, they're all done. And I and I and I am definitely a guy who's like, yeah, you need to do pre-production. Yeah. You need to do writing sessions, then you need to do pre-production, then you got it, then you gotta go in. I skipped the pre-production. And I just I went right into the studio with these guys. What are you gonna give me? You yeah. know, that I was that was pretty much the question every morning was what are you gonna give me? You know, and then it would be like, and then I told everybody, you can't, you can't get you can't get hurt if I don't like something or if I want you to do something different. Just it's not like let's not it, this is like we gotta do what's best for the song. And that was in a, an ever evolving kind of process. Yeah. And sometimes, sometimes bam. We hit it, hit it on the head. And then there's a few songs on that album that I that it's just like I'm aiming at the bullseye. I'm aiming at the bullseye. And then it's just like my wrist just gave out. And I and it, <laughs> it just didn't even didn't even hit the dartboard. Yeah. And it's like, okay, eh, I tried. I just saw this interview recently with Matt Damon and, and Ben Affleck, something like a recent interview. And they were talking about putting like writing as like early in their 20s. And Damon said that Affleck said to him back then was don't judge me on my bad ideas, judge me on my good ones. Like, and yeah. I took that as like, give me, give me the safety and the, sec and the security to, to fail in this artistic well, process. Yeah. Yeah. No, what were some of the, and it, it's funny because this is, that's something that you learn as a songwriter or I always use, I always make the uh, comparison to, uh base uh baseball players you know all that guy hits the ball three times out of ten he's a superstar right you know um you know you write 40 songs you know i i always and i always love this one too when a band's like well we had about 85 songs when we went in to record the album and it's like we came out with 10 it's like no you had 75 shitty songs <laughs> <laughs> that's why they're not on the record all right, you know, or little pieces <laughs> of song, you know, and it was like we had a lot of material, and until it was more or less formed, it was it was like okay, let's not judge it, let's yeah. let's let's just be cool and just accept what's going on. And if something really didn't feel good, or if it, or if it really felt like a dud, it was just like eh. And that kind of you kind of know, it. don't you? Like yeah. you know, like when a song yeah. isn't working. At this point, I better. But there is this other thing. Maybe it's just not working with these people, right? Or maybe it's not working for this project. Fair. So it's, don't don't throw it away completely. But I'm notorious for deleting hard drives oh. with material on them because it's, and everybody's like, "Where's all the B sides? Where's all this?" They don't exist. You know what I mean? Because yeah. I I I'm I'm very I'm a, I'm a very harsh editor of myself, you know, at a certain point, I'm just like, you know, someday I will regret deleting stuff, <laughs> but you know, who wants to hear a bunch of half-ass songs that weren't good enough to be on the album? Fair. I, as a songwriter, I know like there are times where I'll get stuck and a song needs a bridge or needs a chorus that I'll be working on for months. And it's just not happening. And then That's I'll it. have another song and all of a sudden you know what i think that bridge works better in this one and it's yeah. almost like an organ transplant you know it's right. like that song dies for the life of the other one and you know you salute it you, you say thank you very much for your service but then yeah. all of a sudden it brings life to this other song yeah and, you know especially bridge i love bridges i love a good bridge and sometimes those are the hardest things to write you know and you've got to like and but to me that's like they call it the kids call it the drop right it's yeah. just like and yeah. that's if there's any kind of organ plan transplant that I've used, it's mostly the bridge that I'll grab from some song that isn't working. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I yeah. mean, it's amazing doing it because I, I love writing bridges because I think it just like it. It's like it takes you. It it it, it makes the journey of the song oh, like yeah. bigger, you know, and like and, yeah, and, and I love the dynamics of things like that, you know. And, and that's something like modern music is not really sort of that thing. Yeah. I, in a lot of ways, it's just sort of very 
it's more about the vibe of it, you know, in a lot of instances. I'm noticing a lot with songs because I I love big hooks, you know? And yep. I remember listening to an interview with Bob Mould and him saying, you gotta have a hook. You gotta have a hook. And I was like, yeah, you gotta have a hook. And I love big hooks. And um, so I tend to be like very much, you know, when it get to the chorus. Um, and I'm noticing a lot in music that the choruses are are much looser than the ones that I've I've written. You yeah, know, the song kind of moves in this very sort of not not like spike peaks and valleys, but sort of more like a like a rolling vibe to it. Yeah. And some of these pop songs by Dua Lipa and Lizzo, it seems like they have a, have even two or three choruses. Yeah, like, you know, right. it's almost built towards social media where they'll they'll drop like social media based on each new course and you're like wow that's a great new song and then you realize you go listen to the whole song yeah. and it's like oh those are those are three courses in with, within one and i don't yeah. know if it's a bad thing you know it's just like i there's i have some appreciation for some of that and i think like some of the stuff that they've done and i i i try to stay on tiktok so i can communicate with our fans and so i understand what language to use yeah. and i think they do a great job with it I don't know if it in 20 years from now we'll look back at those songs the way we do the ones that we're talking about with those great hooks. I don't know. Yeah. But, but maybe, I, I mean, you know, I mean, like when you and I were kids playing our music, the guys before us were like, ah, you guys, that's shit. <laughs> yeah. Know? No, right. Like, like it's always it's always that thing. The generation behind you is is gonna shit on you, you know, a little bit. They're going to shit on you a little bit. And it's like, that's okay. Like we, yeah. were, we were definitely not embraced by a lot until up until, up until uh, John Bon Jovi and, and, and the Rolling and the Rolling Stones let us go and open for them. And, you know, John's become, you know, a, a friend and, yeah. and um, it's just, you know, it was funny because I, I, I went back and, I hated Bon Jovi when I was a kid. I was just like, no, man, I'm so punk. I'm indie guy. And I'm like, okay, I'm going to, I, I went back and listened to Slippery One Wet. And I'm like, I'm like, okay, I completely understand why this album is like one of the biggest records ever. Because yeah. it's so, the songwriting is so unbelievably tight. You know, and like, and, 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 or like the new Taylor Swift record, that songwriting is insanely good. Yeah. Production is so cool. It's like, okay, it's not my thing, but like, it's undeniable. Yeah. Same thing. There's a, there's a Katy Perry, that teenage dream record. Yeah. Yeah. I listened to that record and I'm just like, it, at first it kind of made me cringe. And then I was just like, wait a minute, man, this writing is insane. And the production is so tight. Like there's no fat on that record at all. Yeah. You know? And it's and like it's kind of nice to be able to open my mind up as I'm getting older to, to different kinds of things rather than, you know, shoe like, like pigeonholing myself. No, this is my, my thing. You know, it's like you can learn from, from everyone. You sure. Know? And I, the way that you're able to have, the instrumental hooks along with the melodies with the, with the vocals and the choruses. Um, Richie Sambora and John Bon Jovi did that wonderfully when it came oh. to those guitar hooks. So that came along, you know, you knew you could drop a needle on anywhere on that record and know what song it was. Right. You know, the thing about Bon Jovi was they were telling stories. Yeah. They were, they were telling stories and they were, they were, and they were, those songs were more important than the rest of the songs that were in that genre to me at least yeah they, they had they were they were they were better written they had something to say they spoke to a very very large group of people at at a very soulful level yeah i mean and like i would go out and watch those guys every night i could not believe like it was like the crowd it was like when you hear those stories about the Beatles, oh, we stopped touring because we couldn't hear anything because the crowd was screaming. So 
And it was like the crowd is screaming so loud and stomping their feet. You wow. think Rina is going to collapse, you know, because it, his songs hit people at such a visceral level, you know, more so than all those other bands. Yeah. And, you know, uh, and I, I didn't, there was a lot of that stuff I didn't like, you know, but, but, um, but now in retrospect, I look at those things and his, his voice was different than all those other guys. You know, he wasn't, he wasn't an operatic singer. He was, he's, he sings like a, like a blues rock and roll guy. Yeah. And he had that charisma. You couldn't take your eyes off him. And he had you that know? hair chest. <laughs> 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 Another writing tandem was Mike Campbell and Tom Petty that did the some. Best. Yeah. The so I know that you have a video coming out with OAR for I yeah. Won't Back Down. Um, yeah. How did that come about? Um, we were hanging out in the studio. Mark and I work out of the same studio and, and Greg Wattenberg is our friend and producer and songwriting partner for both bands um, and uh, guru and uh, prankster. And uh, we were all hanging out and then I don't know how it came up, but then we were like hanging out and um, and yeah, we made, we started playing with it and Mark and I were swapping lyrics and just, it was just like, yeah, man, this is really cool. So then, you know, the drummer from OAR came in, the guitar player, Robbie played the bass. Um, you know, I sang and played very little guitar. And um, and it just worked. It was just, it was cool. It's like, I Tom Petty has emerged for me as, as my absolute favorite songwriter because I equated him at the beginning of his career, you know, um, with like, the Pretenders and yeah. Elvis Costello and um, Nick Lowe and people like that. I thought, oh, this is the same kind of running. It's got this really kind of quirky voice, you know? It's yeah. like, cool, you know? But it was there was something kind of uh, like, a, and or like a band like Television or something like that. It was just, it wasn't, it wasn't cock rock, you know? It was yeah. rock, you know? Uh, it was, it was, and you could hear the roots of it. You could hear the influences of it, but he twisted it and made it something new, you know? And he, he, that guy was fearless in the things that he created. Yeah. And he always managed to pull it off because he had the early stuff. Then he had the stuff he did with Dave Stewart, then he, which was, which was bordering on straight up, like, you know, electronic kind of new wave stuff you know there were there were a lot of elements of that but the tom petty songwriting was still there you know yeah. the, the songwriting was still so impactful and then then the jeff lynn stuff yeah insane yes insane yeah. how good that is could you imagine being in a room with tom petty george harrison <laughs> dylan oh no. and <laughs> all like the traveling wilburys just like trying to throw lyrics back and forth and trying to compete, you know, even though you've yeah. got like the best songwriters in the world, but just trying yeah. like the, trying to elevate what you're trying to do to show off a little or be like, Hey, I belong here. Yeah. And, then, and then to be able to walk away from that project and work and write songs for Roy Orbison and then go start writing songs for yourself. It's like, talk about a graduate degree in yeah. like, in elevating your songwriting, you know? Yeah. yeah. And he was and someone. Jacqueline's production is just immaculate. Yeah. And but he, and Pet, Petty was one of those guys that if you look at his, the breadth of his career, he never sacrificed for fads. He just, he just did himself. Yeah. And there wasn't an emotional rescue in the lot of, right, of right, what right. he did. Right. Yeah. yeah. And, um, and he just, he went to the very end making Tom Petty songs. And he also, there was this swag about him. This is like, like this, fuck you. Like even at the beginning, like with that Elvis Costello, he was slightly punk. But he was yeah. like this American roots rocker that kind of yeah. had this fuck you kind of like, this is what I'm doing about yeah. it. That he was awesome. Dress, he didn't wear his hair like those guys, anybody else. He just he he had this kind of crazy, quirky voice. He's doing this kind of impersonation of Bob Dylan, kind of. Yeah, yeah. You that know? sing that sing speak thing that he would do, like yeah. with even the losers. I I think oh, the first I love that song. Yeah, I think the first petty song i heard was woman in love or the waiting it was right around yeah. that time and mm -hmm. with mike campbell's guitar it was 
there was just enough reverb on it that kind of made it spaghetti westernish but like dangerous yeah. and yeah. biting you know those solos were i could i knew every single solo just as much as i knew the right. choruses and that comes back to what we were talking about before is like how infectious that can be yeah well mike campbell's guitar playing is so unique and he's no i mean i'm sure he's considered a guitar hero but um you know like I, some some reason i feel like wow you know this guy should be more revered as a guitarist yeah you know, than he is but but he is you know so it's kind of strange i you know i think his so like i love i love when mike campbell takes a guitar solo it's just like this is awesome because he can he can do the tricks, but it always sounds cooler than when the guys are doing the tricks. Yeah, you know? and there's a certain element of the, his his guitar solos are kind of really well composed. You know what I mean? Absolutely. Like, like it's not just like flailing around playing a ton of. No, he's very economical in those in those bars that he has to work with. Yeah, you know he he like any good story has a beginning, a middle, and end, a conflict, and a, and a and then the resolution. And he writes those solos in that way, where wow. he knows exactly when he needs to be out. Right. You know? Yeah, that's amazing. That's amazing. Uh, him and and like David Gilmore. Yes, I was going to say it. Like, and those are two people that they've created phrasings and a tone, and like you know exactly who you're listening to. Same thing, like yeah. if you're listening to Miles Davis play trumpet, it's like. It's not, it can't be anyone else, right. you know? And when you hear Mike Campbell play, you're like, that's fucking Mike Campbell, man. This is, a, this has got to be Mike Campbell. Yeah. As a, you know, what's funny too is like, you know, when you, uh, people talk about Led Zeppelin, man, they were the heaviest band ever. And then I go back and I listen to those albums and I'm like, wow, that guitar is really sort of tiny and clean. And, you know, it's sort yeah. of like, you know, it, it doesn't, it doesn't have it in my my memory of those Zeppelin songs is so much blah, bigger than when I go back and listen to them now. And you're like, wow, it's all drums <laughs> and and and, both, and like really the the guitar is very kind of small and you know, but it but what he's doing is so cool. Yeah, know? and they say that between like twelve and eighteen, those formative years of when you're a kid, like music just takes on such more meaning for you because you're hearing things for the first time. Yeah. And even though you might hear a reggae song that's been around for 25 years, you hear it for the first time. Yeah. And for the rest of your life, that is what you remember great reggae to be. Yeah. Right. right. It's yeah. just like, I mean, when our minds are, when our minds are still uh, susceptible to that. So what still excites you about going out on the road these days? Um, honestly connecting with that audience and like and like going to myself saying to myself and thinking about this the music industry has changed so much and the fact that i've been able to have a career as long as i have and i still get to get up in front of big crowds and play it's like that is something that you should ne that I will never take take for granted. Yeah. Um, and I'm and I am really really grateful. All I want to do is connect with that audience. I want those people to go home and feel better about whatever the hell happened. I want and this is this is something I was talking to someone else about this. We live in a very polarized sort of society. And it's very scattered. And yeah. I don't believe people, I, I think COVID fucked everyone's mind up, um, including mine. Ooh. But but I don't think people are able to keep up with the technology. I think, I think, I think we're all a little uncertain, right? About the future, whatever, you know. Um, but live music, no matter what your beliefs are or or whatever the spectrum that you're measuring um people from all parts of that spectrum come into that room and they got one thing in common i want to see this show 
Yeah. I want to enjoy this show. I want to hear my favorite songs. I want to see these guys jam. I want to, I want to rock out. I want to have a few drinks, you know, and a few laughs. And I want to go home and feel better. Dude, and that's I, like, I want that so bad for those people. And it's yeah. like, you've got to be an entertainer. I got to be an entertainer. It's like, it's like, it's, yeah, I get to be an artist in the studio and I get to be an entertainer on stage. Right. You know, and that's cool. That's amazing. It's, I was, I read somewhere that one of the reasons why church is so powerful, regardless of what you think about religion, it doesn't matter is that there's this shared experience of singing hymns together and like, and so singing yeah. along. So to come to a concert, it's our new cathedral, right? And their hymns are your songs and they're standing next to someone they care about and they're belting out the chorus yeah. of your song with you. Yeah. And it's this shared experience that everybody gets to feel and forget about everything else except for that, that just elation of that moment. And yeah. you get to provide that for people. What a great fucking job. Oh my God. It's amazing. You know, and I mean, there's, don't get me wrong. It's like, you know, there's nights where I'm just like, shit, I'm tired. Or like, or like, I'll catch myself once in a while. I'll be standing there playing and I'll just be like, oh shit, I forgot to put my laundry in. <laughs> and I'm like, no, 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 get back in the room, get back in the room. You know, but like, you know, or oh, I miss my kid, you know, whatever. But, and, and, but, to be able to like, yeah, I mean, it's like, and you think about it too. It's like, you, I, we as performers and entertainers in that, you, you owe it. Somebody, somebody's going to spend, you know, 400 bucks on tickets yeah. and then 50 bucks on a t-shirt, $30 on two shitty watered down beers, parking, all that stuff. That's a lot of money. Yeah. That's a lot of money. You better bring it every night. Leave your shit at the side of the stage. You can pick up your grudges against Robbie and he is <laughs> about the music industry and how you hate politics and all that. Da, 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 da. You know, dump it on the side of the stage. You get up there and you do your fucking job. <laughs> I love that. Maybe next summer it's the do your fucking job tour. Fucking job tour. <laughs> <laughs> Well, look, Johnny, it's been such a pleasure talking to you. Thank it you so much fun, for man. making Thank time, Rude. So and good luck on the tour. I'll be seeing you here when you're in Los Angeles for yeah, damn definitely. sure. And you know what? I'm going to hunt down that that T-shirt. I'm going to find one for my drummer. I'll send you the. I'll send Peter the link so you can have it. Thank you yeah. so much. I appreciate it, was, it, man. It was my pleasure. This is Will Hawkins, and you are on Hotel Americana, and we'll see you next time. <laughs>